on behalf of cfa society india i welcome all the participants to our webinar titled pio insights managing uncertainty before i introduce the speaker today let me run through few housekeeping rules this is a one hour webinar speaker will be present for 30 minutes followed by 30 30 minutes of q and a participants are requested to post their questions by q and a on their screen there is a section called q and a on your screen you can type your question under the same section as usual we keep telling you your feedback is extremely important to us it helps in developing better content for our future webinars and future conferences please fill the feedback survey form the link of the same is was available in the email confirmation which you got as well we will be also posting the link in the chat section at the end of this webinar the ppt used in this webinar will not be shared with the participants so you can make your notes while the ppt is being presented i would now like to introduce our speaker for this webinar mr navneet manoj while navneet does not need any introduction uh, he is the chairman of cfa society india but a few words about him navneet joined sbi funds management as cio in december 2008 he has over 25 years of rich experience in financial markets in his role navneet is responsible for overseeing investments worth over usd 100 billion across various asset classes in mutual fund and segregated accounts in his previous assi assignment he was the executive director and head multi strategy boutique with morgan stanley investment management prior to joining morgan stanley he was the cio fixed income and hybrid funds at bidla sun life navneet is the chairman of indian association of investment professional popularly known as cfa society india navneet is nominee director of the board of sbi pension funds He is a postgraduate in accountancy and business statistics, a qualified charter accountant. He is also a CFA charter holder and a CIA charter holder. He has also done his FRM. Thanks a lot for uh, participating, Navneet. Over to you. Thank you, Abhishek. And uh, as Abhishek mentioned, that these are extraordinary times. As Lenin mentioned, that um, there are dictates when nothing happens. and then there are days when decades happen i think we are going through those decades just when the humanity was looking at conquering moon and mars we didn't realize that a small virus will unmask not only the fragility of financial markets but the entire humanity billions of people are locked down across more than 190 countries 15 trillion dollars of wealth has got evaporated in a stock market in last one month or so the oil prices saw the biggest fall in a single day in history several of the emerging markets including india are down 40% in dollar terms credit markets are frozen the spreads have widened volatility has zoomed and till now nobody really knows what lies ahead in last one week alone india has lost foreign exchange reserves of around 11 or 12 billion dollars that's more than what we did in any week since 2008 volatility was at a historically lowest level till few days back and i'll come to that a little later and now in several markets across equities fixed income commodities currencies we have seen volatility at a multi year high or in some of the markets at an all time high levels these are really really tough times challenging times for the entire world you know lot there has been an interesting debate debate is this a black swan event uh, as everybody knows the term coined by nasim talib several years several years back or is it a white swan or a gray swan i don't think it is a white swan something like this hasn't happened over the last 100 years i mean where almost 190 countries have got impacted by a virus this is a pandemic probably as severe as what we saw in the 1918 spanish influenza olympics have got cancelled which has not happened i know for a very very long time but talking about the black swan white swan or a gray swan i get reminded of dick cheney who said there are known knowns there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns so no knowns are those there are things we know we know we also know there are no unknowns that is to say we know there are some things that we do not know but there are also unknown unknowns the ones we know 
we don't we don't know that we don't know is the pandemic that we are seeing now is false under that unknown unknown not necessarily ebola happened just four or five years back and almost 11000 people lost their lives but that was in africa and a lot of people after that including people like bill gates have been warning about a potential risk from a pandemic like this which can engulf the whole world or maybe a large part of the world but i think very little attention has gone towards that and now the risk has come to all of us to the entire humanity i'm sure a lot more uh, attention a lot more thought needs to go to uh, to the healthcare going forward now talking about this pandemic and there are different countries which have reacted in very different manner in dealing with this it started with china europe became an epicenter countries like italy spain and now several others in in, in uh, europe have been suffering very heavily um, now the epicenter actually is us where the number of cases are the highest in the world followed by the countries like italy spain and all as countries have taken varying approaches to lockdowns uh, uh, amidst this ongoing crisis uh, there is this interesting research paper on this subject uh, which i have put here and the study looks at non pharmaceutical interventions such as lockdowns uh, during the 1918 uh, flu pandemic which happened uh, across uh, several parts of the world and this is a study about the pandemic across cities in the in the us and the key finding was summarized in this chart which says that cities that adopted uh, lockdowns earlier or for longer and you can see those green dots they not only had lower mortality but also grew faster in the medium term so clearly the social distancing helped them uh, while of course the study is limited and each country stage of economic development may be a factor too but i thought that this was an uh, was an interesting study an interesting thing to look at uh, in the, in the manner the whole world is looking at this crisis now of course times are different uh, the world is a lot more interconnected. The world is a lot more interdependent. Uh, service sector is is much much larger. So the world is a lot different. But what what clearly shows is what has uh, worked in favor of let's say China or in Singapore, Japan, Korea, and some of the Asian countries. Clearly, I think uh, following the advice of the epidemiologists that uh, more number of tests. Uh, in tracing the source, isolating them, informing, building the database, and ensuring that we isolate them properly. I think that has clearly worked. Maybe some of the countries were a little late, and now the, it's become a global pandemic. I hope that over the next few weeks, as now most of the countries are taking the right kind of steps, over a period of time, we are likely to see some positive news on that front. Now, talking about the economy, there is going to be a supply shock. There is going to be demand shock, and then we'll also come to the oil shock. The economic activity gets generated when people move, goods move, and that movement has suddenly come to a standstill or has come down very, very significantly. Uh, talking about the supply shock, when the supply chains are disrupted, I mean, the, the hardly anything is, is moving in the world. The financing channels are disrupted. Uh, the people who are producing, they are not able to borrow money. Workers are isolated. They may not be able to reach their plant or wherever they are producing. There is a lockdown. So they, they won't be able to, the, the people won't be able to pay to their vendors and then vendors won't be able to pay to their vendors and the whole cycle comes to a standstill. This will severely impact consumer confidence. I mean, you can print any amount of money, you can bring down interest rates, but at this point in time, when people are not moving out, they are not flying, they are not eating, they are not buying, obviously this will have huge impact on the demand. Through the banking channel, as banks will become more risk averse, this will also have an impact going forward, both on business as well as consumer investment. Uh, the wealth effect, I talked about the $15 trillion of erosion only in the equity market, but also uh, several of the other uh, financial markets have got impacted. That wealth, in fact, will also have repercussion on the on the demand shock. Uh, talking about the oil shock, I mean, the generation of petrodollars will stop. This will impact the credit markets. Over the last few years, as the uh, U.S. became a large player in the uh, in the uh, uh, shale uh, oil and shale gas market, their output has increased by three and a half million barrels per day in last three years. 
large number of these companies have been uh, a significant part of the uh, borrowing in the credit markets. Now, the way credit market spreads have gone up, this, uh, the markets have frozen, it will have significant repercussion uh, on, on the credit market. Uh, the price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia amidst a deep demand destruction has brought down the oil prices uh, massively. This will have huge impact. The generation of petrodollars will stop because a lot of these countries won't be able to meet their fiscal needs and they will have to uh, take it out of their uh, sovereign wealth funds or the reserves and that will put pressure on global financial markets. Despite the fact that uh, uh, over the last few years, uh, oil price have been, I mean, despite all the talk about the climate change and move towards non-renewable energy, etc., the global demand has been around 100 million barrels per day. Uh, I think the immediate impact on the oil market will also have its impact on the, on the demand shock as well as on the, on the supply shock. Even before this, uh, people were talking about that over the last 10 or 11 years, this has been the longest expansion in the U.S. history post the global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, Japan was already nearing a, a recession. This was one of the worst quarters that they had since 2008. Europe was struggling to grow at 1% or so. And now the shock has come completely unexpected to most of the businesses or governments or to the investors and will have serious impact on the economic activity. Last week, if I remember correctly, the US jobless, jobless claims rose by 3.3 million or so. And expectations are that equal number uh, likely to lose jobs this week. So it's, it's going to have severe repercussion on the, uh, on the economies globally. Before this crisis, my view over the last few months have been that uh, since the global financial crisis, uh, financial markets, global economy have got, uh, uh, have got hugely dependent on central banks. Uh, they have acted as uh, what I've written, Yoga Kshima Bahamiyam, that I shall ensure the safety and well being of my devotees, as the Lord says in, in Bhagavad Gita. Even if there is a geopolitical risk in any part of the world and markets are worried, if there is a credit market risk anywhere, if there is a slowdown or a recession in any part of the world, central banks will come and, and help the market. The put options sold by the central banks have kept the uh, volatility at an extremely low level. In fact, just a few weeks back, the volatility was lower than what it was in 2007 and some of the previous episodes of the crisis like this. Uh, this entire money printing, which went up from, I remember, uh, around the 2008 crisis, the total size was around, between these four or five large central banks was around $4 trillion reached up, uh, above $15 trillion. So if the genesis of the last financial crisis was excessive leverage, what we have done in last 10 or 11 years is not reducing the leverage, but shifting some part of that leverage to the central banks. And because of the lower interest rates, because of so much of quantitative easing, because of the put options sold by the central banks, uh, there has been a risk-taking behavior. The global debt to GDP has actually gone up in last uh, 10 or 11 years. If you look at uh, most of the markets, even the CLO market in US, the junk bond market, the triple B market has become the largest segment uh, in the overall bond market. And when you look at the leverage, and the word leverage comes from lever, which is like an equipment or an instrument which magnifies the force. So it is not only the financial leverage, but the robo leverage. What I mean, I think Seth Klavan mentioned about it, the robo leverage, the computer leverage, that the way the role of machines in financial market, the algo trading, the machine trading, the ETFs, you know, large amount of money with the hedge funds working on the basis of risk parity, et cetera. And the momentum gets accentuated. And then you have something called an herd or a psychological leverage because everybody has been on, on one side because of the lower volatility when you calculate the value at risk, et cetera. I mean, the risk taking behavior goes up because in any model, you don't perceive the risk that has come suddenly materialized. And now when something like this happens in the market, again, thanks to the Taylor rule, Dodd Frank rule, et cetera, which made the financial system a little uh, stronger or, or, or the banks built up their capital or, or reduce the uh, trading activity, but that has made the markets a little, uh, little less uh, liquid uh, when, when something like this happens. And that's why central banks again had to play the same role of yoga kshema vahamyam. In fact, just a month back or two months back, my, I had a very strong view that 
2020 would be that tipping point where central banks would say that the mental of supporting the growth, the mental of supporting the global uh, uh, economic system has to be taken by the fiscal policy. We have done enough. We can't do anything more. I mean, when you take rates to zero, taking it much below zero entails several other risks. I talked about the risk-taking behavior. I mean, when you take rates to a much lower level where they've gone, it also endangers the profitability of the financial system. We have seen what has happened to the banks and, and financial institutions in Europe, in Japan, etc. And I thought that US wouldn't go there. But because of this crisis, they again had to come to the rescue of the world. So they again, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, usual template, the cut rates, Fed came and cut 50 and then 100 basis points have gone to zero. In fact, the US Fed is doing extraordinary stimulus they would end up probably printing or, or supporting the market more than what they did in 2008. They're buying treasuries, they're buying corporate bonds, they're buying asset-backed securities, the commercial papers, money market mutual funds, even bond funds, and every possible tool in the arsenal are probably creating a new kind of, of, of tools to support the market or, or or to support the financial system, apart from the forbearance and the other things that we will be talking about in a few minutes. And I think this was, of course, necessary given the situation that has come. But I think a larger part over the next few months or next few years, which was my view even before this crisis, is that the fiscal policy has to play. Uh, in fact, this is the quote I'm borrowing from, I think, the Nixon mentioned it in 1971. Uh, we are all Keynesians now. Uh, as I mentioned that even before this crisis, I thought that uh, fiscal policy has to play a much, much larger role. You would have seen, I mean, U.S. has um, just got, an, I mean, the uh, Congress has just approved uh, or are likely to, to embark on a, on a fiscal stimulus of almost 10% of GDP, $2 trillion. And I look at almost every single country, including what our finance minister announced a few days back. I'll come to that in a few minutes' time. I mean, Denmark is like almost freezing the economy. They are going to uh, ensure that almost any segment which is impacted by, this, by the lockdown or by the slowdown in next few months will be taken care of by the government. So I think supporting the uh, companies and paying salaries. I mean, there are countries which are giving wage subsidies. Uh, they are guaranteeing the loans of smaller or medium-sized businesses or those businesses which may be large, but are going to get impacted very badly. Uh, the the uh, uh, tax waivers, uh, direct cash transfer. In fact, I think that maybe this could be the year where universal basic income will become a reality in almost every country. And uh, you can relate to when you have a crisis like this. In fact, I thought I'll talk about it in the, in the end that we may have the new deal, what we had in like post 1930s, or there has to be something like a Marshall Plan of Europe to take the world out of the crisis that, that we have got into. Uh, the fiscal policy will basically look at three things. Number one, solving the immediate healthcare crisis. So tremendous amount of investment in the, in the healthcare, ensuring that uh, supporting uh, the people who get impacted, ensuring, I mean, every country is doing its, its best in terms of uh, building the healthcare capacity to deal with this crisis in the near term, uh, giving a helping hand to impacted sectors. I talked about whether the wage subsidies, whether the tax relief or the tax waivers or giving the hard cash to businesses, to individuals, to to other communities who really need the support at this point in time. The third will be, I think, in a few months' time. And this was my view before this crisis, that this would be the year where fiscal policy would be used to build a new infrastructure, a new set of physical infrastructure, uh, social infrastructure, which includes healthcare, and virtual infrastructure uh, to meet the demands of, of the new economy. Over the last few years, as I mentioned, that the monetary policy led to an asset price inflation, but the real incomes were not growing in, in large part of the developed world. Still, the growth wasn't as sustainable as it should have been. For that, you need to create jobs. You need to get a more sustainable growth. Also, the challenges of climate change, etc., uh, can be met through by investing more in a new kind of physical infrastructure, which meets the need of, of the tomorrow's world. And I think that will create jobs, that will make growth more equitable, that will create uh, growth more sustainable over a period of time. I think the tipping point will come over the next couple of quarters, where we'll embark on that, which can be good for the world uh, in the longer run. Of of course, in the near term, as I mentioned, bulk of the money will get used to 
one on healthcare and number two on, on giving the helping hand to impacted sectors so that uh, I think it's, it's more about protecting the downside in terms of growth rather than really looking about how, how to grow the economy. Interesting aspect is for a large part of the world, uh, uh, the cost of fiscal stimulus is close to zero because I think interest rates, particularly in the developed world, is, is close to zero. In the long run, of course, as, as most of the governments assume more debt in the next couple of quarters, couple of years, at some point in time may lead to inflation, may lead to higher interest rates, but I think that's some time away because at this point in time for at least in the foreseeable future, we are looking at a substantially uh, lower growth. Now, coming to India, just before this crisis, our view was that I think we are, we are going to have a slow and a steady growth over the last seven quarters or so. The growth has been, uh, has been uh, on, on a downward path. The GDP growth every quarter has been on a, on a downward path. Uh, but of course, I think that there's a new set of challenges have come because of the uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. Now, unlike the rest of the world, India has a very limited uh, fiscal space, uh, but we have a lot of monetary space which has got utilized over the last few months, and more so in the, in, in the last week when monetary policy announced a large stimulus. In fact, if you add uh, only the two or three things, the one percent CRR cut. Uh, 100,000 crores of uh, TLTRO supporting the corporate bond and, and commercial paper issuance uh, of, of like 1 trillion rupees and the additional uh, borrowing that banks can do in MSF, marginal standing facility, another 1.3735 uh, trillion rupees. So put it all together and then with the OMOs that RBI has done, they have done more than 3.2% of, of GDP. There are three things that uh, central bank uh, has to do. Number one, supplying as much liquidity as possible to all the segments. Of course, bulk of the liquidity that I talked about, whether the OMO or the TLTRO, uh, will ensure that uh, the, the GSEC curve or the uh, corporate credit, particularly in the high-grade uh, market, uh, the spreads come down. But you have to do a lot more to ensure that the AA, A and, and below rated entities also get the money. And I think for that, we'll have to do a lot more. The second thing is moratorium because as the businesses are locked down, people don't have the money to pay, the revenues are not there, but they have expenses in terms of wages, interest costs, rentals, and then the fixed cost. And for that, I think the uh, changing the asset, uh, asset classification norms for the banks and giving them a breathing period of moratorium. Now, of course, this will probably uh, uh, help a little bit businesses. But the third thing, which may sound a little uh, philosophically not right, because over the last few years, uh, we moved towards the, uh, the uh, IBC and you know, an early recognition of the pain, etc. But maybe will have to do large scale restructuring. Think about it for large number of businesses, a loss of revenue for a couple of months, and it's not that economies will have a V-shaped recovery. It's going to be a slow and a steady recovery. And large number of those businesses will need the helping hand from the banks because the overall financial uh, uh, conditions of them may deteriorate, may look uh, uh, deteriorated. And for that, restructuring of, of some of these loans may become a little uh, necessary. So as I mentioned, the fiscal policy is limited, but there's a lot that can be uh, uh, done within that also. And just like RBI was bold enough to announce some steps which we have never done uh, in past, uh, apart from spending money on the fiscal side, so finance minister announced 1.7 uh, trillion rupees, but a large part of it is to, is to give the humanitarian aid to the, to the people absolutely at the bottom of the pyramid, which is very necessary and at this point in time. I wish, I mean, if there is more money, and I'm sure with the PM Cares Fund and some of the other initiatives by a lot of corporates and individuals, we'll be able to, 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 to help on that count. But there are other things that can be done uh, with, with maybe lesser spending, because as I mentioned, there's going to be impact on, on the tax. Uh, direct and indirect investment receipts, on telecom receipts, etc. Uh, on the other side, a large part of the budget is, is very sticky and government won't have the fiscal space to spend huge amount of money like the way several of the other countries have done. But through some fiscal incentives, through some administrative reforms, regulatory and judicial reforms, I think several of the industries which have gone through a lot of trouble recently and may also feel the, the uh, heat going forward. I mean, telecom is a classic example. 
but the real estate industry or the auto industry, the airlines, I think the uh, construction industry, several of them, we can think innovatively and boldly. What can we do, do in terms of administrative measures, regulatory measures, judicial measures, etc., to ensure that we provide them uh, some helping hand? I just give one example. I mean, how to think little, little differently. So, uh, crude oil. I mean, it, it's one of the big uh, blessing in disguise of this crisis for India. It has a lot of many dimensions. I'll come to that. But can we use our foreign exchange reserves to create crude oil reserves at this point in time? I mean, uh, of course, as I mentioned that last week alone, we lost $12 billion, but we still have uh, something like uh, uh, almost $360 plus billion. And I'm sure there's a lot of scope uh, for us to really use these reserves uh, judiciously and crude oil could be one. Can we work on something like a gold monetization, the amount of gold which is lying with households or the temples, etc., and can we... Can we monetize that? Uh, I think the, 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 there are various ways we can look at supporting the industry, and I think that's where everybody needs to focus on. Talking about the crude oil, I mean, a $1 fall is like uh, $1.3 billion saving for the country, which may get split between government, uh, uh, the uh, businesses, corporates who use oil and, and the consumers, large part of it may be retained by the government simply to make up for the losses on the revenue. Uh, but there are some other dimensions of crude oil. I mean, we shouldn't have a straightforward, you know, the chart or how much it is going to positively benefit the country simply because remittances may get impacted. Uh, as I mentioned about the angle of petrodollars, I mean, the investments that come from the sovereign wealth fund, et cetera, that may have some negative repercussion. And also lower crude oil uh, signifies that the global economy is in a, is in a bad shape. And, and I think that will also have uh, some impact. So before this crisis, as I mentioned earlier, our view was that India has bottomed from this quarter onwards. We are going to see, uh, I think, all the cylinders firing a little bit. I mean, we were seeing the scootering of, of most of the cylinders, but at least consumption will start with the, with the recovery in the rural economy, with the, some of the other measures taken by the government. At some point in time, the investment cycle uh, starts bouncing back this year with government spending a little bit of recovery in exports. I think we are going to have a slow and steady growth in, in, in the economy. I think now it has got a little, uh, little effort. Now, thinking about at this point in crisis, uh, uh, as, as Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And there are, of course, this, this is very different. Something like this, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't seen in last uh, century or so. I mean, you have to go back to 1918 of influenza or, or in some other manner, I mean, compare that with let's say the world wars and all. But th th there are interesting parallels. In fact, I'll, I'll show you one slide where I put a couple of books where one, one should be reading at, at this point in time to look at what happened during those crises if you are in financial markets. So in 1942, uh, uh, Dow Jones bottomed, I know much before the, uh, the world war uh, got over, much before the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, nuclear attack because the Fed cut trades to zero in 42 and the market actually bottomed before the war got over. From my little experience over the last, um, I started investing uh, or, or at least taking interest in the equity market as a small kid in 80s. And I remember in 19, early 80s, market started doing well. Then you had a prime minister who got shot down in her own house in India. And then it was like, you know, a lot of people were saying the market should be shut down for several days because there's not going to be any buyer. And then suddenly you had a prime minister with a majority, which we never had in history. And I saw a big bull market in 85 and 86. Then you had some of those Bofors and Mulder Commission and variety of things over the next few years. Uh, the crisis in Punjab, the crisis in Kashmir, in Assam, in, 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 the, in the Northeast. And then you had a coalition government in 1989. Over the next two or three years, India went through one after another crisis. We had to pledge our gold in 1991. You had an Iraq war. Our foreign exchange reserves were like billion dollars or so. And then in 1991, if I remember, I think Sensex was at 950 or 1,000. And in a year's time, I saw the market going up three or 400 percent, almost 300 percent. We went to 4,000. Again, over the next several years, we had like coalition governments in 97, 98, an Asian crisis, where rupee fell, I remember, from 31 to 40 in a matter of few days or weeks. Uh, the Procran uh, nuclear test, and, and you had like sanctions on India, the 2000 tech burst, 2001, 9 11. Uh, the big market crash in 2004, 2008, the Europe crisis, 2012, 11, uh, 13, 
uh, I mean, the 2016 early uh, when we saw the crisis in, 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 in the oil market and in China impacted India. But in this period, I've seen Sensex going up from 400 to, to 40,000. And, and always, I mean, at that point in time, it's very difficult to keep the, keep the sanity. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, in, in these kind of times when, when uh, you know, you are going to have so much of noise as Buffett says, it's important to keep the sanity when everyone else is, is losing theirs. And in these days, you know, I keep thinking that the internet gives us an illusion of knowledge and an illusion of control because we read so much, we think that we know, know so much. And also uh, some of the emotions take over and particularly the biases that we need to keep in mind as like loss aversion. I'm, I'm sure everybody knows uh, thinking fast, thinking slow of, of Kahneman that uh, the, the pain of losing one dollar versus the, the joy of gaining one, the pain is much bigger. The recency bias where we just extrapolate recent events or the recent market trend, the bandwagon effect when everybody was, was very positive and everybody very negative and suddenly it can change. The confirmation bias, I think some of these things we must keep in mind uh, as, as the wisdom of crowd. I, I, I believe in wisdom of the crowd. I also believe that you move from one point to from wisdom of crowd to many of crowd, and it's important that, uh, that 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 we keep some of these things in 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 mind when we go through a period which is extraordinary. Now, from a fund manager's perspective or investor's perspective, you know, the important thing to think at this point in time is how do you really really has the lack left tail risk. Uh, the left tail risk is the events which have very low probability of occurring, but have huge consequences. And it's very, very difficult because we all know that I mean, there is systematic risk and there's the unsystematic risk. Unsystematic, we can diversify. It's very difficult to diversify the systematic risk. You can do asset allocation or macro hedging, etc. But the way markets have been and everything falls together, it's very, very difficult. But there's a good time to have a little longer term think, uh, thinking about them. Of course, one should have done that before this crisis, but also it's a good time when, when something like this happens and how do you really save the portfolios? And I think as, as the FDR mentioned and, and uh, that we have to fear the fear itself in, in, in times like these. And at this point in time, I would like to say that there is a there's a part, uh, there's a uh, interview or the speech by Charlie Munger, the psychology of human misjudgment, and that can really come uh, come handy. The last point uh, I want to talk about that while these are extraordinary times, all of us are locked down in our homes, and and we are going through a very very uh, challenging time uh, for humanity. But our faith in human ingenuity, I mean, the world has seen world wars, the world has seen terrorist attacks, world has seen epidemic. I remember several centuries back, uh, economists like Malthus mentioned that the world will run out of food with the, with the population increase. Population has gone up 500% after that. And then today there is more food than, than the world can consume. I'm sure because the crisis has engulfed the whole world, we are going to work a lot more on the healthcare sector going forward. I feel positive that I'm sure something in form of medication or vaccine uh, likely to, to, to uh, come out of this. Uh, as I mentioned about the New Deal, as I mentioned about the Marshall Plan, large reforms happened in 1991 when we had such a big crisis and we didn't have the FX reserves and liberalization happened. I'm sure the humanity will rise to the occasion. All of us will rise to the occasion and we'll, we'll, we'll build a, a new world. Something interesting that after the nuclear attack in 1945, there's not been any nuclear attack. And I, I think like that, that maybe after this, we will never have the humanity will not deal with, with, with a risk like this, because I think we'll be a lot better prepared. Interestingly, if you see the history, uh, the, when the London had the plague, the entire sanitation system, the new sewage system, everything got built after the, after the plague. The Mumbai that we see today, a lot of it actually got built in a different manner after the uh, after the plague that hit Mumbai a century back. So I'm sure positives will also come out of it, and we have to live through this period. Uh, talking about like all my my friends from the uh, CFS Society who are sitting at home and, and and listening to me and my colleagues at this point in time, I just tell you something interesting. Uh, I read that Isaac Newton developed calculus at home uh, when Cambridge University was closed due to the plague. And I'm sure uh, the newer way of working, the newer way of thinking, and, and we can really utilize this time. And there's a reason my colleagues have put up uh, this idea of, of connecting with you on a daily basis through different webinars. So uh, thank you so much for joining. And Abhishek, I'll be uh, very happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Navneet.
I, I talked about some of the some of the books over there, uh, Jared Diamond, I mean the uh, Peter Bernstein, uh, Neil Ferguson, some of these guys, uh, I, I think it, it, it could, could be a good time to read some of these books to get a sense of what has happened in history when you go through these times, what happens in markets, what happens in economies, and then all of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Navneet. Uh, uh, I now open the forum for Q&A. Participants are requested to send their question in the Q&A section. Uh, I have already received a few questions, so I will begin with that. But in the meantime, participants can send their question. So Navneet, I really liked your uh, moon, Mars, and the virus uh, quote, which you started in the beginning. So while you know human beings are uh, achieving a lot of things, but they are just getting rattled by a small virus. And you also spoke about uh, credit markets, currency, crude, COVID-19, correction, a lot of Cs. And you know, markets are reflecting all, the, all these, you know, there's a large scale disruption. How deep is the impact on Indian economy? You spoke about the impact, but I want to understand the deepness of this and how will you stack this recession against the previous three recessions? So the 2008 crisis, so I mean, I mean the, the parallel that everybody has got in 2008, there are a few differences. One is that I think from a fiscal perspective, because we had like five, six years of phenomenal growth between 2004 to 2008, we were slightly in a better position to, to provide a much bigger fiscal stimulus. Also that it was a financial crisis. It wasn't as deep. The country wasn't in a lockdown. Two third of the GDP I think, uh, I mean, the sectors and all which get counted for two thirds of the GDP, I think are, are in a lockdown. I talked about the supply shock as well as the, uh, the demand shock earlier. So it is it's going to be quite a bit. We were already having uh, six, seven quarters of slow growth. Before this, our view was that the rural economy is likely to recover on the back of better monsoon, uh, higher food prices, more spending by the central and state government on the rural economy. And over a period of time, uh, that will reflect in higher, higher consumption growth. And over a period of time, as capacity utilization goes up, and with some of the other measures taken by the government, including the, uh, the tax rate card, dividend distribution tax cut, and the other reforms, will lead to an investment cycle. We were also hoping that a lot of money uh, is likely to come in the form of FDI for all the measures that have been taken to attract money from sovereign wealth fund, etc. Now that will take some time and that's why I think we are, we are, we, we are in for, for a challenging time at least for a few months or a few quarters. Uh, the monetary scope is, is pretty large uh, to provide support to the economy and as I mentioned earlier, we have to think more innovatively. Uh, we have to depend a lot more on the domestic investors now because global investment Investors. I mean, this is probably, if I remember, if memory serves me right, I'm in a one lakh crore plus of selling by foreign 100,000 uh, uh, crores, uh, more than a trillion rupees of selling by the foreign investors in equity and debt market uh, in a matter of like three or four weeks, I think is absolutely unprecedented. Uh, so we have to rely a lot more on domestic investors. They have been showing huge resilience. So maybe I think uh, over the last couple of years, uh, whatever we have done, uh, for the, let's say, mutual fund, AI, PMS, advisor, distributors, maybe all of that, we need a rethink. Uh, we need to have a rethink on some of the other industries which were uh, facing certain challenges earlier, how we can support them. Uh, RBI will surely do a lot more, but maybe from all the other policymakers' perspective, I think we'll have to do a lot more to ensure that uh, economy doesn't suffer as much as uh, the rest of the world. Uh, there are various estimates. The global economy is likely to be in recession in 2020, and uh, like if you look at the IMF and some of the early estimates, I mean, they're, they're, they've already got downgraded very, very significantly from where they were two months back. Again, the parallel from 2008 uh, with the fiscal and monetary stimulus and the biggest stimulus by China took the world out of recession in a very, very short period of time. And we had the longest expansion in, in, in the history. I think this time it's, it's, it's going to be a little tough and that's why we'll have to work a lot more harder to, to get growth uh, back on track. And I hope that everybody will rise to the occasion. Something interesting, I'll take two more minutes. I, I took a little longer in my presentation also earlier than we thought. I think one of the, the interesting aspect in this, and if we rise to the occasion as, as policymakers and businesses and, and leaders, it could turn out to be a Y2K moment for India. There's going to be a complete rethink on healthcare. I mean, the aging population in the world, I mean, the antibiotic resistance, and now this pandemic has clearly exposed and masked the fragility of, of the uh, humanity. I'm sure a tremendous amount of spending is going to happen on the healthcare sector over the next several years. I think India can play a big role there. Uh, also including the medical 
medical tourism apart from what we can do on the pharmaceuticals and the chemical side. It could also be a Y2K movement for India simply because a lot of supply chains will, will get shifted. The world is interconnected, the world is interlinked, the globalized world has also exposed the risk of too much of concentration in few places. As the world looks at shifting the supply chain and India has the inherent advantage of being a large domestic market, a large labor supply, and now a lot of favorable policy in terms of ease of doing business, lower taxes, etc. And I think if we if we play our, our, our game right over the next several quarters, not in the next few months, but I think we can we can aspire to really grab a good share of that and i think that can really turn out in in our favor but we'll have to keep our fingers crossed whether the lockdown is for three weeks or i think it's going to get a little extended even after that may not be in a complete lockdown format but even a gradual opening and how much it impacts variety of, of businesses so as of now i think difficult to predict uh, i would say i mean the only certainty is probably continuity of uncertainty but the longer term picture hasn't changed i think we need to work hard okay and since you mentioned about the kind of efforts which is required with the current scenario do you see a threat to india's credit rating so as i mentioned earlier that the whole world will be printing so much of money and i hope that rating agencies won't look at us in isolation they will look at it all us on a relative basis the debt to gdp whether in china whether in us overall debt to gdp and you have to combine the sovereign balance sheet the corporate balance sheet and the household balance sheet of combined basis i think india is not as bad as some of some of our peers and even some of the uh, some of the developed countries and the thing in our favor is that we don't have large implicit liabilities like you know the unfunded pensions or the medicare etc as some of the other countries uh, may have and i think because we are a, we are a young country uh, we have a large period of, we are long period of, of growth ahead of us i hope that rating agencies look at us with, with that framework the framework for rating agencies will have to undergo the change because the way the fiscal and monetary stimulus is likely to come, the way businesses will get supported because something like this has not been seen for a very, very long period of time. And I hope that they take time to, to put that new framework and then assign the rating with a, with a completely new scale. So uh, if I correct, uh, if I understand correctly, you think for time being rating may not be relevant to look at as one of the key parameters till situation exactly. becomes normalized. Exactly. I mean, so, uh, I mean, look at that debt to GDP of like every country after after the stimulus and, and in that. Uh, so, so rating is relative, right? So when we are a triple B minus, you are comparing with somebody who's A and who's double A and who's triple A. I think all of those metrics where, where when you look at their debt to GDP will also undergo a change. In the very near term, of course, this will put pressure on our financial system. We already had some fault lines and that's what I mentioned. I think the sectors where... Uh, real estate and some of the other uh, infrastructure and power and all of that. I think we need to be need to be very innovative, very bold, and very creative in ensuring that uh, uh, we support those those sectors to ensure that the linkages between the real economy and those sectors and the financial system and the and the overall uh, uh, real economy. I mean uh, that, that that they don't become a, a vicious cycle. We have to ensure that we support those sectors in a manner that. Uh, the health of financial uh, system is not endangered. I mean, over the last few years, we have done a uh, lot of hard work in terms of repairing the balance sheet of earlier the public sector bank. There were a few challenges with a small part of NBFCs, HFCs, and private sector banks. But again, uh, we were moving towards a resolution and, and trying to, to build that. Uh, the rest of the, the uh, pub, private sector banks is in a, in a good shape. Uh, public sector banks' balance sheets have got repaired, but we should not allow uh, newer fault lines to have have a bigger crisis going forward. So I hope that the right steps will be taken by by all policymakers. Right. Uh, another in interesting question which is coming is generally people flock to precious metals like gold in such time. But uh, in this point, this point in time, we've seen uh, a bit of setup in gold as well. So what is your broader view in gold as a uh, as an asset class? So I think the negative interest rates, I think maybe a little uh, less faith in fiat currencies because the way money is going to get printed and will move to a helicopter money in large part of the world. Logically, I mean, it's, it's positive for the gold, but you know, in last few years, one of the positive for gold was huge buying by the central banks, but now they'll be putting their resources at some other place. Uh, it was also like in last uh, couple of months and quarters, 
a uh, lot of buying in the ETFs, but now there are redemptions across all asset classes, including gold and also the physical demand from countries like India, China also is going to get impacted. But just as a, as a kind of, you know, a hedge against the uh, l- l- less faith in fiat currencies, gold may do well ultimately if the central banks continue to do globally what they have been doing. On real estate, you know, in, in the near term, it's negative. I mean, when you come out of the lockdown, the last thing in your mind would be like, go and buy a new property or something. But having seen the drawdown in financial markets and in the in the assets which are marked to market, I'm just thinking and I've seen that post-2008 where something which is not marked to market, people look at some of those asset classes also. Investors look at those asset classes slightly differently. And I don't know, uh, maybe I think because of that reason, you see, some bit of interest in, 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 in real estate because of that reason. In the, in the near term, I think because of the, uh, because of the income destruction and the, the other wealth destruction will have a negative impact, but maybe over a medium term, you see some interest going back to physical assets compared to the uh, financial assets. Okay. You spoke about a uh, you know, lot of uh, policy measures required both from fiscal and monetary perspective. Uh, do you see there is a proper coordination between central government and central bank? And, you know, India, historically, we have seen that uh, fiscal stimulus has played a played major role than monetary stimulus in order to revive growth. So where do you see uh, that factor coming into the picture, considering that there is a balance sheet issue at the economy level as well? So, you know, between the 2008 and 13, we had a period of like negative uh, real rates and that led us to a lot of challenges in the which ultimately got manifested in high inflation and, and high current account deficit, a weak currency, ultimately came to, to a, a, a you know, problem on the fiscal front, et cetera. And as a reaction to that, from 2014 onwards, we have been very conservative. We moved from negative real rates to positive real rates for the last four or five years. Uh, we, 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 we kind of remained very conservative on the fiscal front, et cetera, apart from a lot of other regulatory uh, tightening, apart from a lot of other administrative and judicial and, and, and the policy tightening, et cetera, across the board because of the policy paralysis and you know the excessive uh, leverage and, and the excessive uh, credit creation crony capitalism and all of that so we we, we have gone from one extreme to to maybe another extreme and now i think uh, maybe a time has come at least given the situation where both the monetary policy and fiscal policy have to be very very supportive not only to protect the downside for the economy in the very near term, but later on to stimulate the economy. And I think we'll have some support because I think the inflation is likely to remain well contained. We'll get support from lower commodity prices, particularly the, the crude oil. And I'm sure I think that, that, that there, is, there is a lot of good coordination among the, uh, among the central bank and the, and the central government. I hope that just like the central government and central government that you talked about, just like GST Council is a great template, how the central government, state governments can work together because the state governments spend a lot more money than the, than the central government and and then they, they, they are the ultimate link to the, to the people uh, at the last mile. So just like a GST council, maybe a health council, a power council, a land council, a labor council, uh, I, I, I think that there is a lot we can, we can do on the GST council format and I'm sure over the next few quarters, few years, we'll, 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 we'll do that. In your talk, you spoke about IBC, you spoke about, you, you have a bit of glance on banking sector. Can you can you delve a deeper into the current crisis which banks and MBFCs are facing? What is your uh, overview on of the sector going forward, and also how it is how you know gov- what government can do to revive that particular sector? So the credit growth was was already at a very low level for a variety of reasons. I mean, bit of risk aversion, bit of I think the uh, the challenges that we came, uh, we, we had on the NPF front and also the uh, lower growth for a variety of reasons. Now I think we have another challenge where the country is locked down. There is going to be a supply shock and a demand shock. Large number of businesses are closed. They will need a lot of support, a lot of moratorium. But then what happens? I mean, you can ask the banks and NBFCs to, to uh, have a moratorium on on their asset side, but you know, the borrowings that have been done from the financial system, you cannot have a moratorium on that. You cannot have a moratorium on on the deposit side. Raising capital may not be for the large banks, but raising equity capital also in current uh, environment is going to be tough. Uh, Raising ECBs, which a lot of NBFCs and HFCs have done in last uh, 
couple of quarters is going to be tough uh, given the global environment. So there are going to be some challenges on the liability side, apart from the challenges which are there on the asset side. And that's why the uh, huge handholding by the policymakers and that, that, that's over and above what I talked about, the central bank and the central government, I think other policymakers will also have to come to support, ensuring that, that the, the domestic savings continue to channelize into the capital markets through the mutual funds and, and, and the insurance and the others, uh, ensuring that whether, whether working with the rating agencies or whether working with all of these entities, all the market participants to ensure that they are able to, to, to uh, 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 have, have a lot of helping hand to, to survive this period and then come out stronger later on. It's going to be a very, very challenging period for the uh, for the financial system. Uh, good part is that, as I mentioned, I think resolution of some of the entities, uh, also the uh, money raised by the private sector banks and, and some of the NBFCs, HFCs globally, and the repairing that had happened of the public sector bank will come handy, but again, a, a new set of challenges have come. And that's why focusing even on the liability side is going to be very, very critical. So you, you were very positive uh, on healthcare sector when you spoke and you just gave your views on uh, on banking sector. Uh, anything else would you recommend if somebody has to buy now any specific sector you're bullish in India from five years perspective? So, I mean, that was not a view on the sector as such, but some of the changes, I think the way of, of working, the way of living, the way of, you know, I think a lot of things are going to change on a fundamental basis. Maybe we'll, we'll have another con call because that, 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 that I've got views on like uh, that the world can change in a meaningful manner, which is which cannot be visualized today. This is something absolutely uh, unprecedented. Uh, what, what, what the humanity is undergoing, and I think our interaction with the world, uh, the way we are going to work, I think a lot of things are going to change in a fundamental work. The healthcare sector clearly. Uh, comes to mind where I think we'll have to completely rethink uh, because it has clearly exposed the fragilities that uh, that we have to serve the aging society and the last society in the world. But I think a lot of other things are, are likely to change. I mean, the work from home seems to be working fine for a lot of people. So even organizations will have a rethink in terms of how they work, how they deal with, with each other, the BCP. I think that the digital technology may have a completely uh, 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 different, uh, I mean, there, there could be another digital transformation, the way uh, government deals with the, with people, the way businesses deal with each other and businesses deal with consumers, that there are going to be huge changes there. And I'm sure, what do you have to look at if you are, as, I mean, if you are asking from an investor's perspective is look at the resilience, if I can just use the one word, look at the resilience in, in the business, the businesses where the management or the owners are agile and nimble, they will not only survive, I think they have the firepower uh, in terms of their balance sheet capacity or, or cash or, or ability to raise resources, but also the nimbleness and agility to come out stronger once the crisis is behind us. And we have seen after every crisis, there are, there are businesses that come out stronger and I think you need to focus on them rather than having a large sector specific view because market is smart. I mean, the sector which are going to get impacted highly negatively in the very near term, I think it would already be been the price. What you have to see in those sectors is those who are going to, going to survive and, and come out stronger because there would be consolidation in some of those sectors and in some of the other sectors, I think the people who can invest right uh, and then who come out of this stronger uh, will, will, will be the ultimate winner. Interestingly, when you look at the valuation, I mean, uh, and you put it on, on Excel sheet, the cash flows of next few quarters, so the profit of next few quarters is a much smaller part of the overall value when you look at the growth economy like India. A large part of the value actually comes from the terminal value when you look at beyond 2022 or 23 for, for next several decades. That hasn't undergone a change. What you have to see is how much impact it has in next one, two, three years, depending on the magnitude and the longevity of, of this lockdown. Okay. Any views on real estate as an asset class? So as I mentioned earlier that I think in, in, in the near term, uh, there would be challenge. And of course, I think uh, the, the, the sector already had some bit of challenge. The commercial real estate was doing well, thanks to the amount of money we have got from a lot of global players and the, and the REITs, et cetera. And of course, I think the, the incremental supply demand uh, dynamics were improving. Residential were slightly different. Again, there will be some pain in the very near term. But I, I, I think I need to form up my view, but maybe I think the uh, the, Negative real rates again, and at some point in time, as having seen the drawdown that people have seen in financial markets, maybe for, for them, um, 
in, in asset allocation if real estate comes back. And as prices get adjusted downward, and as I mentioned about the restructuring, the third pillar of, of what the policymakers need to do apart from the liquidity rate cut. Second was the uh, moratorium and the third restructuring after that is done and maybe a lot of lenders possess the real estate, maybe there could be, uh, there could be a different story a few quarters down the line. Uh, with so much of uh, both monetary and fiscal stimulus around the globe, uh, do you feel emerging market stands to benefit once the things normalize? And if yes, where does India stand globally? So, you know, before the 2008 crisis, I mean, that was a golden period of, of emerging markets. After that, actually, the, the developed markets did well. The DM equities did better than the EM equities. I mean, the U.S. equities was like one of the uh, best performer. I mean, in the last few days, few weeks, the carnage has been very high. Look at Brazil, South Africa, Russia. I mean, there were some of them were like uh, the best performing market last year. I mean, look at India on, on a... And in, in dollar terms, I mean, markets are down like 40%, 50%. So price erosion has been has been very, very severe. Now, several of these markets are also linked, particularly the commodity producers are also linked with commodity prices, as well as the China. So I think it will take uh, some time for the, for the recovery. Maybe the commodity consumers like us benefit a little more, but then we have our own, own set of challenges. It's structurally over a longer period, surely, I mean, that story hasn't changed that uh, EMs have a better growth profile simply because of the demographic profile, simply because uh, the, 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 the investment demand for a much, much more longer period is much higher. Last few years, thanks to the cheaper money, thanks to the tax cuts, particularly in the US, uh, the technological uh, advances and the, te the technology companies, the way FANGs and some of those stocks did, uh, the DMs outperformed. Maybe I think in, in the first set of recovery, they, did, they do well. Uh, but in the longer term, I think the story for EM hasn't really undergone a complete change. Okay. Uh, post central bank announcement, how do you see rate transmission? Especially if you see uh, the CRR rate cut, which has been used after a very long time. I think I remember last time it was used was by Dr. Subara five times in one year. And after that, it has never been used. So, no, the CRR is so... Yeah, so CRR was used once, I think, 25 basis point in, in 2013, but that was before the taper tantrum and then we actually had rate hike and then again, uh, big rate cuts later on. Uh, in terms of rate transmission, one of the challenge has been, as I mentioned earlier, is I think on the fiscal side, uh, and then the market's ability to absorb the uh, supply from the central government, the state government, plus the uh, plus the PSU supply, and of course then the private sector. If you look at the overall uh, financial savings in India versus the total issue and this year, because the fiscal deficit will go up, I think they are not uh, fully um, uh, enough to to absorb that supply, and I think we'll have some bit of challenge there because savings are pro cyclical again. Uh, savings don't increase by cutting down on consumption. Savings go up and growth rate goes up. People consume more and people save more. When more jobs are created, incomes go up. So in the very near term, we'll have that challenge. So maybe the rates will get a little bit of pressure from the fiscal side. And as the foreign investors have been selling rather than buying, that will also put a little pressure. But on the other side, I think RBI will do everything possible. And now the whole world is, is following Mario Draghi we will do whatever it takes. And I think RBI is also doing, and I think they will have a firm resolve to ensure that in this period, when growth is going to take such a hit and we'll have comfort on the inflation front simply because of the demand destruction uh, globally and the commodity prices remaining low and the and then the uh, growth is going to take hit. Uh, we support as, I mean, I'm saying that the policymakers support as much as possible to ensure that rates go up, don't go up. So most likely in line with the rest of the world in the near to medium term, uh, interest rates remain soft. Longer term picture, I think we'll have to wait and watch what this monetary stimulus along with the fiscal stimulus do to the world uh, over a longer period. The low for longer, I think, is, is more for the short term and the medium term. Uh, longer term, I think the, uh, the jury is still out, and I wouldn't like uh, Hazen to comment on that. But in the near to medium term, I think rates are likely to remain soft, mainly because of the support from RBI. Okay. Since we're running short on time, Navneet, I will just ask uh, three, four questions, more like uh, uh, bullets you have to answer in one word. So active investing or passive investing in these times? I think both because I, th I think depending on, on your view, your asset allocation and, and, 
which segment of the market you think that you would like to to play through active or or passive i think when, when there is a lot of dislocation in the market when there is a lot of uh, divergence in the market generally it is good for the active managers uh, so from that perspective maybe active managers can can do better they had challenge in last few years uh, going forward what would you choose large caps or mid cap and small caps so when there is indiscriminate selling by foreigners because they have redemption they are not looking at the fundamentals you have selling by the retail investors because of the margin selling not that they have a view on the fundamentals or the interesting value of the company and then there is like indiscriminate selling by people who are very fearful opportunity gets created across the board large caps have fallen more actually because there is more liquidity there maybe the mid and the small caps uh, i think because of lower liquidity and also now with a lot of restrictions in terms of higher margins etc I mean, we will see the impact over the next few days but i think you have to be bottom up as i mentioned i mean look for the resilience in the company rather than looking at whether it's a large mid or a small cap uh, would you choose healthcare or uh, digital ecosystem <laughs> so in the listed space i think the digital scope uh, space is like very very limited i'm sure some of them would be a beneficiary but when i mentioned about the digital transformation or technology transformation i meant about all businesses it is not only about about the uh, the digital com- the so called digital companies even in the in the financial space i think those uh, winners who are doing business differently today i think we 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 will come out uh, better so i think that's true for like all businesses healthcare i think there is a there is there could be a white to k movement just like for a lot of other engineering companies and a lot of other other, other companies in india chemicals is another space that comes to mind okay uh, namneet lot of participants have requested if you can share the slide of the books once again on the screen uh, because they were not able to see those 8 10 books i which just kind of uh, put few names there uh, but i think there there could be more and, and not in fact you should read a lot of other positive things i think i think read the victor frankel uh, man search for meaning read i think a lot of other positive stuff but this is basically to make sense of history when when the world has gone through some of these challenges and and you know I, i think history is 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 like a very very in psychology are 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 good subjects to to be uh, to to read to be a good investor and uh, from like uh, build up the you have to develop mental models as charlie munger says and maybe some of some of these books may come uh, come handy but also to remain positive you should also read uh, uh, hans rosling's uh, factfulness i think uh that there are a lot of positive things that are that are around us and in this period we should not uh, lose sight of of that and i would just say that you know, dark clouds are always followed by a shining sun and this time won't be any different i think have faith in the human ingenuity i think we have come out of of every single crisis and we came out stronger and this time won't be any different so this too shall pass you have aptly summed this thank you very much navneet for your time uh um, i request all the participants not to forget to fill the feedback form uh, please follow us on our social media handles facebook twitter linkedin we are going to have webinars on a daily basis till 15th of april uh, uh once again thank you all for participating stay safe stay healthy thank you very much let's measure up as a safe society members yes we should let's measure up.